Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Rafael Ramirez. I'm a governing body fellow here at Green Templeton College. I worked uh, for uh, 18 years with Richard Norman. This is, I think, our 12th Richard Norman lecture, which is a joint venture between our college, Green Templeton College, and Norman Partners, which is a firm that I co-founded with uh, Richard Norman before he passed away. And we have the good fortune of remembering his work through a series of lectures with uh, a remarkable group of scholars. Uh, Richard was um, famous for being a reflective practitioner. The book on the left here, Management for Growth, was a version of his dissertation. He didn't like the word managing uh, in his title. Apparently, there's a word in Swedish that is closer to what today management scholars call purpose. Mm -hmm. Purpose for growth. And uh, maybe he was the first scholar of purpose. Uh, when you read that book with that angle, you can reread it as something that was way ahead of its time. Um, he then became a guru on service management. Uh, was the uh, one of the three or four leading scholars in service management, created the service management group, which was my first job when I came out of Wharton, working with him. We created this joint book on uh, designing interactive strategy, which was also a Harvard Business Review uh, paper. And uh, as he was beginning to uh, die with um, cancer, he wrote uh, Reframing Business which became the core strategy book for the MBA at Gothenburg, uh, but nowhere else, unfortunately. So um, very interesting book, very difficult to read uh, book. There's a fifth book that came out posthumously that he wrote uh, as part of his fight with cancer on healthcare. This year, we have the wonderful honor to have Andy van de Ven, uh, uh, a good friend of Oxford. Uh, you said eight books with Oxford University Press? Seven books? Yeah. 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 So uh, Oxford University Press has been a good vehicle for Andy. He's been here uh, as uh, uh, a number of times uh, visiting the UK as an AIM fellow. And um, he has been most generous with his time. There was a, a wonderful session this morning with um, graduate students from across our college. Uh, there is a session that Mark Van Trester, who's sitting at the back, is hosting tomorrow at the business school. And uh, um, he also had a session with uh, the Norman Partners colleagues. Um, there's great difficulty in summarizing Andy's contribution. Here are five of his books. Um, he has done great uh, service to management theory, management education, management scholarship, and management fellowship. He's developed quite a lot of work on methodology, including longitudinal research, uh, notably at 3M. He has championed engaged scholarship, which we as practice faculty uh, in this university and in other places uh, take as an important reference for our work. And he has uh, taken a lot of his very valuable time to revisit Richard Norman's work and relate it to his own work. So very welcome, and thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. My pleasure. You don't have to work. Yes. Got it. Yes. Thank you. It's a wonderful honor to be here and to share with you some reflections on Ricard Norman. I didn't ever meet or know him personally, but I ground my teeth at the University of Wisconsin at Madison as a doctoral student reading his Administrative Science Quarterly article on, on uh, innovation. And then I've been following his work since. And I've talked with many people about him who all speak very highly of him as a person and as a scholar, as someone who was, had a true passion 
for understanding and advancing knowledge and practice. And he had incredible contributions in all of his papers and books, uh, as we have just reviewed the various books. I mean, he has been a pioneering scholar who influenced management scholarship of process, of growth and innovation, of learning, leadership, service and product innovation, business networks and ecosystems that we were talking about this afternoon, reframing business strategy in his latest book, and also his very interesting work on clinical research methodology, which largely reflects where we were going with the idea of engaged scholarship. But he was far ahead of the time. And so as I look at this, I can't possibly reflect on all of the things that he talked about. But I'd like to focus on a couple of things that has significantly influenced our own work. And they deal with innovation of product variations and reorientations, growth processes, uh, social construction of tasks, cognitive and political systems, way ahead of his time. Not looking just at the technological aspect, but also the social political aspects and the cognitive aspects. I found that fascinating. Uh, statesman leadership, a point of view that brought out the importance not only of political processes, but also of being a forerunner in understanding the elements of contradiction and paradox and conflict as inherent in any innovation effort. And certainly from the point of view of statesman leadership, which stands above, if you will, the pros and the cons, the uh, sponsors and the critics, as you find in everyday organizations. And if I have time, I'll also comment on his clinical research methodology, for it provides some real insight. But first, let's talk about what he talked about in 1971 on product variations and reorientations. And I love the way he did it by thinking about them in terms of variations and reorientations. Variations, basically, from a technical point of view, being thought of as only minor changes, incremental changes that unfold in an organization, uh, as well as basic uh, versus reorientations, which are basic changes, new types of specialist knowledge and task subsystems. If you will, this is change in a system, this is change of the system, which then not only has an important point from a task or technological point of view, but went on to the political system point of view, accommodating within, for inc variations, incremental changes, you're making the accommodations that, uh, uh, and existing policies within the existing system, right? Making some adjustments, as opposed to reorientations that entail a new politics. That is, new goals, values, supporting power structures are necessary to engage in them. And then in terms of the cognitive side, talking about how incremental innovations represent existing attention to the rules, policies, procedures, heuristics that are used uh, with no real change in its domain, whereas very orientations require changes of domain, mediated perceptions from the secondary environment, external cognitive structures, change the rules, the attention, the decisions, the interpretation uh, are simply inefficient for them. Now, that's quite a matrix, isn't it? And he didn't stop there. He didn't another. He was a forerunner in thinking about time. So, in over time, he writes about it in terms of the initiation period consisting of the feeler phase and developmental phase of some new idea, a product innovation, but also service innovation and the realization period, a subsequent stage consisting of market penetration, exploitation, and stabilization. And he talked about how the patterns, the processes of change are different in reorientations and in variations, but contingent, again, far in advance of where we were. The conditions, the context matters. 
And it varies by the consonants among dependent units, their ability to interact and communicate with one another. Enabling and constraining bureaucracy, which is the extent to which this process unfolds. And in particular, emphasizing the issues of learning and leadership and environmental relationships. It's always the organization adapting to the environment and environment organization relationships. And so these were ideas that really struck us early in the game, based upon our reading of his first book, <laughs> as well as initial articles, to guide ourselves in studying the Minnesota and launching the Minnesota Innovation Research Program in 1983, in which we said, we are very interested in studying a wide variety of innovations, product and service, technological and social, as well as healthcare, um, government uh, planning and so forth, and talking about and through extensive discussions coming to the conclusion that the innovation process consists of changes in ideas, people, relationships, out of context, and outcomes over time. So if you want to understand innovations, examine these five concepts over time and observe what activities people are doing as the process unfolds. We didn't do this alone. We had 30 investigators, about 15 faculty and doctoral students from about seven or eight different academic departments at the University of Minnesota. And so we met about every, this is a long time ago, you can see how we've changed, but we, we met, this is a particular picture taken in 1987 where we conducted workshops in a reflective process with managers and with other academics who we invited to come to Minneapolis and to engage in day-long or two-day discussions of what we're learning and what we think about this process of innovation. And from that, we learned so much from the very organizations that we were studying and from the outside academics and from one another because we were constantly engaged in discussions, meeting every two weeks or so, and uh, quibbling a lot about how, well, how do we study innovations and what processes should we use. We, we knew we wanted to do something big, something big, which said that, you know, if you looked at the literature at that time, there were something like 800 studies that have examined the antecedents and the consequences of innovation. We all know that you invest more money in R&D, you're going to get more innovation. But we don't know very much about how that unfolds. So you give an entrepreneurial team a pot of money, and voila, now I'm going to have an innovation. Well, the process, the sequence of events that unfolds over time is what struck us. So the very basic process, if we call it, was to adopt a grounded theory approach very much like um, uh, Richard Norman would have adopted in his reflective practice of view. So it was the, a wonderful dean, David Lilly, who was a former CEO in the Twin Cities of the Toro Company, who had become dean of the Carlson School of Management, the School of Management Business School, at the time. And he said, would you like to go and visit the, and meet the corporate community, and I'll send you out an invitation, or I'll send out a request from, oh, about 30 executives, and suggest that they meet with you, and you go ahead and arrange your schedule, would you believe, within two weeks, I had arrangements to meet with 30 executives in separate discussions, and these were just very open, brief discussions, but they were uh, important in one respect. Not only was it an opportunity to engage with, but also to ask the question, what keeps you awake at night? And in listening to their answers, coming out with and beginning to see, hey, there's a very simple, common answer that I've heard, which is, I'm doing fine today, thank you, but I'm really concerned about the future. What do we do to have innovation that will engage and provide a sustainable way of this company staying in business 25, 30 years hence. And of course, this time slide has changed a lot. Now it's 
how do I stay in business for the next three years, you know, kind of a thing. But I sent an email back to the executives and said, you know, you have commonly talked about this. Would you be interested in being engaged in a research study that we, if we did it, launched a study of the process of innovation, of how your company and others are developing innovations from concept to implementation. And about half of them said, yes, I would be very interested in that. And to which then, knowing that, also getting invitations to do so, led me to, in a, in a series of seminars with doctoral students and faculty and that we have on a weekly basis, begin to send out the word. You know, we have invitations to do studies. How many of you, who of you, are interested in doing innovation? And through this snowballing process, we began to find other faculty at other departments who were engaged in innovations, and they were engaged in a wide variety, so that we were able to begin to say, some of the faculty were very much interested in hearing health, therapeutic apheresis, apheresis, uh, others were more into systems, government defense systems. Others were into school site-based management. Some were into entrepreneurship, computer startups. Others were, we were engaged with uh, the commercialization of space, uh, NASA, and nuclear safety standards, government strategic planning, etc. So you see, it, there were these tremendously different innovations that we were interested in and got access to because the faculty came with their interest, plus the invitations we had from businesses. And that led us to say, let's go out and take a look what innovations look like. We did our homework. We had a fairly clear set of ideas about how the innovation process unfolds based upon studies of innovation. And, you know, according to uh, that, uh, the research was suggesting that there are very similar established ideas. Namely, the literature at the time said the innovation journey unfolds this way. There is basically some entrepreneur or innovator who comes up with an invention that needs to be operationalized with a set of people who work together on an ongoing basis from concept to implementation, and who uh, then engage in a, a set of relationships with one another that stay in place throughout the period of time in which the innovation gets established. And we can identify the final results on uh, that some new stable order emerges. And that would be the implementation of an innovation. Lo and behold, <clears throat> we went into the field and started talking with and observing what was going on in the various companies that we had access to. And we got a, such a very different story about how the process unfolds. Through reflection, we concluded that, you know, just for an example, none of the innovations consisted of a single idea being developed and pushed. They were constant reinventions, proliferating, re-implementing, discarding, and terminating ideas as they were going along. And the people involved, well, there were many who got distracted. They fluidly engaged through skunk works and part-time works. And the people who were there at the end were, were not there at the beginning. It's a total turnover of people. And so, if, for example, the context, the innovation process itself creates and constrains multiple enacted environments. So it isn't the environment that's determining how the organization is going, it's the organization and its innovative shifts from one thing to the other that's changing the environment. Well, so that you can see led us to an important set of revising of concepts, which then led to us to begin to say, okay, now let's track in these ideas, people, transactions, context, outcomes, as we are observing them, by observing how they change. And we did that by saying, let's develop an event data entry form. <laughs> so we'll be looking and we're doing interviews, we're getting organizational records, we are sitting in on meetings, depending upon the kind of innovations that we have access to. And we are saying, on a given date, an event occurred, some activity or event, and uh, this is what we describe 
And then this is what we observed. In other words, this is how we interpret what was <coughs> observed. And it occurred, the source of the information. And as much as possible, when we were not there ourselves, we would rely on two independent sources, like a good journalist would, to record that that indeed occurred. And based upon these keywords, we would code them according to ideas, people, transactions, context, and outcomes, like this. So an event became a row in um, a data file. And we would record the day, the event, observation, source, keyword from which then we would return and begin to record whether or not the, this event represented a change in idea, core or related, people, transactions, context, outcomes, and so forth. From that, we could then begin to say, aha, let's develop a bitmap. A bitmap is a recording of the number of events that reflected changes in activities and the outcomes that they perceive from those activities. And you have here an illustration of two of the innovations where the lighter line, which isn't particularly clear, are the actions, doing more or less of what they were doing before. And the heavier lines being the outcomes, having more or less good news or bad news in a given month. And then we begin to say, let's see what's going on here. It turned out that relationships between actions and outcomes here were near zero. The relationships between actions and outcomes were really strange, negative here. And finally, they began to become positive in the end. What's going on? And the what's going on is to begin to diagnose the structure of these time series and finding that, yes indeed, in the beginning in both innovations, actions and activities were unrelated, they were in fact random, using various diagnostic tools, the BDS statistics, the Lyapunov exponent, and other things that I've learned from nonlinear dynamics from my engineering colleagues who know this language and who recognize that any structure of a time series has these different <coughs> dimensions. One dimension, you know, a point is one dimension. A line is dimension one. A square is dimension two. A box, cube, is dimension three. Now, start thinking, what's the fourth dimension? Some people say add time. Okay, go on. What's the fifth dimension look like? A sixth, a seventh. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on in this world that is a five, six, seven more dimensional space. So let's count the number of spaces, number of dimensions that it takes to record the dots. And then we observe that indeed, in the beginning, these innovations occurred at random. Then they submitted a proposal to get funding, which brought them down into kind of a periodic, orderly, controllable space. But as soon as the innovations took off, they became chaotic in dimensional space, about five to seven. And then they ran into problems. They had to pull back, converge, and then they diverged again. And they converged. And in the end, had to come up with this. From that, we said, uh-huh, what's going on is from first recognizing with Kevin Dewey, who I learned all of this stuff from, recognizing that innovation events follows a negative power law. Have you ever heard of a negative power law? Right. It's the occurrence, the frequency of occurrence of small things first and big things very... In so, initially, in the upper part, we have very many events that seem to count for nothing and very few events that are big and significant. What does that do to Ricard Norman's proposal? to look at variations and uh, transformations. And the answer, it seems, is, therefore, no innovative reorientation without variations. The quest to look for significant radical innovations and not incremental innovations, quite frankly, does not recognize 
the nature of the relationship between radical and incremental. You need lots of incrementals to get a radical probability. And you know, this negative power law also reflects pink noise in random space. And pink noise is the structure of the size of cities in the world. It's the, the length of words in a dictionary. This negative power law seems to reflect many typical physical and non-physical patterns. This negative power law also seems to reflect the distribution of uh, stock market prices. Hey, I think we've hit onto something here, which suggests a way of starting to combine things. Don't separate things out into different kinds of distributions. You need lots of, lots of, lots of incremental innovations in order to hit upon a few small ones. So our major finding was this. The innovation journey is a nonlinear cycle of divergent and convergent activities that repeat over time in several cycles of the innovation process. Implications. Ricard Norman said it. He said, given these findings, Norman said in 1977, he asked the question, is it possible to speak of control at all in this context? I am trying to establish guidelines of some kind to help companies which want to generate developmental processes, just like we are. To do this, he says, it is necessary to understand the very essence of the process of knowledge development. What is unique about it? And what distinguishes it from other processes in a company? Only by developing a suitable language for describing the process can we begin to understand something of the ways in which they can be influenced. So he was pre, he was laying out our agenda before it even emerged. <laughs> And now we'll also talk about some of these points, but let me intercept and intrude at this point to say, now you see where we're going. We're gonna talk about these things, but I, won't, I, I hate, now I'd, I'd like to stop the lecturing and begin the conversation. So would you please interrupt and let's start off right now. Anybody have any comments or observations about what I've just said? And do you agree? You, you've met and you know, Richard, were your observations of what I've just said of variations and um, uh, transformations uh, similar or different from mine? Because now we're all beginning to interpret the contributions and the ideas and how they can be expanded and brought up to date. Mark, oh yes, thank you. Thank you very much for both your own ideas and also engaging so much with the Richard Norman uh, work. The, you know, the, this you know, famous book of yours and, and others have thought of these issues, the innovation journal is nonlinear, uh, cycle mm -hmm. of diversion and convergent activity. Is it worthwhile to think about the context of those journeys? In other words, are they turbulent worlds? Are they well-structured worlds? Does that shape the nature of the journey? That this kind of approach really gives us the innovation journey as a phenomenon in its own right. And I'm wondering if anyone has tried to link that back to broader context or institutional rules or... Great question. I think it's a frontier question for us to be engaged in. We do know that time is tremendously different for different kinds of innovations. So as we were studying the development of hybrid wheat, that takes 40 years, 40 years of um, breeding the, the male and the female strain of seeds that then get combined to produce the hybrid seed. So there's a biological time clock to that innovation. On the other hand, 
if you're developing a biomedical innovation in the United States, but also in Europe, you need to go through a Food and Drug Administration to decide the safety and the efficacy of the process. So count on it. That's a 10-year project. If you're interested in studying new business startups for software companies, you're talking about a six-month innovation effort. And on the other hand, if you're studying something about innovation in small group development, it may take only an hour from beginning to end in forming a team. So time, for sure, is one answer to that question of context. There are other answers. What do you think? What do you think are the really key issues? So that this innovation journey that I sort of skept, scaled out here applies in different settings. And there's the macro social context in which you're innovating. And that acceptability of particular developments has to land at the right sort of social context. So a really good example of that would be the failure of GM crops to really take hold in a positive way in the UK. It came at a time where the discourse for GM was not supportive of spread. And so actually that was counter, I mean, innovation for sure in terms yeah, of yeah. The technology was already there, but it's implementation through to acceptability and to market <coughs> shortened, its, it shortened its potential lifespan in the UK. And in the same way, uh -huh. I think, you know, I spend a lot of time talking about automated vehicles. That's a prime example of how technology may well have innovated to a certain degree, but what we have is a legitimacy gap in the middle. So I think all of this has to be set within the context of the way in which those markets are operating in, in social and economic dimension. Two issues really come out strongly as I listen to you, and you're right. One is the social context is the social political readiness for change. And, but Ricard did talk about that in terms of ideas in good currency and pushing and riding them. So, in a way, he was ahead of time for us to be thinking about. The other thing that strikes me, too, is that no innovator, no innovation team, no matter how big, can do it alone. They all have to run in a pack, which I'll come back to later on, too. <clears throat> Come, yes. Um, I have a question about, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, uh -huh. This is an early form of your engaged scholarship, in a way. And yeah. I was curious about the, the, the practitioners, how they responded to this, and did it change their practice? And does what you found, did it change over time? Did you find something else as a result of that? So I was just curious about working with the practitioners, whether this resonated with how that changed their practices. They loved the feedback that we provided. We did surveys in addition to, you know, just mapping events. And we'd ask people in the organization, how is this innovation going and what are their issues and suggestions? And without us necessarily, we were basically the tabulators of the surveys and sharing with them what we heard which became wonderful learning experiences from the researchers as well as them because we would say, here are the findings and since the past six months, people have gotten more concerned and more disappointed by this innovation. What's going on? And then everybody begins to participate and share their views and their perspectives about how this process unfolds. And we learned a great deal about that and the qualitative insight so that we learned scenarios <laughs> which are told to us by the managers and the people. And so as we listened carefully to them, some of them would say, what's wrong here? Well, the organization isn't doing us right. We are entitled to something more. Whereas others were saying, yeah, this is going well. And uh, what's going well is that a feeling of enablement and positive encouragement. And, but the interesting thing was there was an interesting distribution of responses for almost all issues. About 20% or 25% for, positive, about 20 to 25% against, negative, 
and the vast majority, about 50%, um, are ambivalent. I could care. So what? Doesn't matter. Don't worry. I got more important things to worry about. I'm dealing with my students or my patients or I got other work to do. Those upper people, I don't know what they're doing, point one, and if I did, I don't care because it's just all politics up there. Sound true? <laughs> Have a ring of truth? Yeah. Yeah, good. Can I just ask about the convergence and divergence? You yeah. seem to describe running into trouble or needing to get refocused, like uh, convergence was somehow imposed? Uh, did you find times when the innovation system was also naturally convergent in the way it was naturally diverging? Well, yes. Uh, they, they, with the initial funding, they were pursuing, and some of these branches that they fell upon looked really interesting. And so they converge to say, let's do this more. Mm -hmm. And as we do that, so a simple example is we're going off on a discovery to try to find good tasting food. And sure enough, we we'll go along and we run into ice cream. <laughs> wow. And then going a little bit further, we said, not only is it interesting ice cream, but I really like strawberry ice cream. Let's converge on strawberry ice cream and figure out how to produce that ice cream. And as we go along in there, all of a sudden we got to diverge into various kinds of strawberry farmers and understand how to make better strawberries or how to produce other things. So you could see how that cycle would go back and forth. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, please. By sector? Yeah, in terms of you, you have quite a, a spread of different types of organizations you're dealing with. And I spend nearly all my time talking to innovation leaders in FMCG. Um, and they're looking for rigidity all the time. They're looking for increased process. Um, and that's making their process longer. On the other end of the scale, they say, I want to make it quicker, but I want more process. And I wonder whether. Clearly there were, as you looked at these very different kinds of innovations, very different processes going on, and many people would say, why on earth are you studying such apples and oranges by way of the different kinds of innovations? Do you really expect to see any commonality? To which we said, yes, that's why we're doing it. We're searching for a wide variety of different contexts and settings in which innovation takes place in order to identify what is similar about it. And yes, indeed, in searching for and listening to all of these different types of innovations, while there are certainly variations, the qualitative content of what was going on with those innovation teams seems to follow this typical journey. In the beginning, as the data suggested, People, it's pretty much of a chance variation. Chance events are unfolding. Shocks are triggering people's attention, and then an innovation team is founded. That allows for you to shift from this randomness to down getting a proposal for funding a project. Then, in that developmental period, these typical things occur. Within a few months of starting a project, the best of plans went awry. And soon you found the need for shifting because things were getting very, activities were proliferating. There was lots of different issues that all of a sudden became recognized as important or needed to be concerned. All kinds of mistakes and setbacks arose. We thought this, but we didn't, and we didn't find this or that. The goals that we had set at the beginning and the criteria for achievement are, are changed. We were thought we were moving toward A, but we got to go to B or C. <laughs> and the innovation personnel that we thought would hang around for a while were gone. That's great for infusing new ideas, but it's terrible for learning. 
right? Lock into developmental paths. We entered into relationships. Nobody could do it alone with this other companies, other partners. But then all of a sudden, these goals and the directions and the technology are changing. So we got to change our relationships. But my partner blinked. So it was a breach in relationships, contracts. I thought you would be a good partner, you bastard. You screwed me. And recognizing that building an innovation infrastructure was also a significant thing because no one could do it alone. You may be developing a really neat new biological innovation, but you need a whole host of other complementary innovations to make them work. Yeah, please. question. I'm not sure if I understand how it would, what do you, like you said, first of all, in some cases, innovation does not represent a change. Is that correct? Well, if, I would say innovation, it represents change, right? Is that the... Well, I, I guess that's an assumption, yes, that the assumption would be that if you've got a new idea, mm -hmm. program or product, you want to start up and introduce, that it would represent some kind of a change. But interestingly enough, one of the characteristics of at the end of the journey, we found that in almost all cases where innovations got implemented, it was integrated into the old system rather than added on to the existing system. So in a way, it's almost like a contradiction. The implementation of an innovation is not to change the existing system. Why? Because an existing system is all already 100% or more dedicated to a particular mission or direction. And people's times are totally invested. And so the creative part of an innovator would be to figure out how to integrate the existing new system in such a way that it is not visible. So we think of innovations as something on top of what's already going or replacing something what's going, as opposed to thinking of it as integrating into the system in a way that is conducive. So, uh, Andy, can yeah. I ask uh, on that topic? Score. Yeah. Did you find any issues related to uh, resistance from the old system to accept an innovation? Oh, yes. I mean, that, that is kind of standard, isn't it? And it, we found that it in, increases the less the people who have to implement the innovation are a part of the process. In other words, organizations that separate the innovation subsystem from the operating system <laughs> will produce more innovations, but fewer get implemented because of the resistance. So how does, during this process, we find that as you're going through this developmental period with all these problems going on, to involve the organization or the key elements, you can't do it all, the entire system, but the key elements within the organization that will become your potential adopters is critical. Yeah. Just I mean, I'm, I'm really interested in that point, um, simply because in the sector in which I, I spend most of my time, there is a dilemma at the moment whether or not innovation is going to come out with the existing incumbency. So innovation is going to come out with, out with the, the incumbency. So it's not going to come from those who are powerful within the industry at the moment. 
we can actually learn ah, from yes. Yeah. And whether or not there is, I mean, I'd be really interested in understanding whether or not the research gives any indication as to how, you, how certain you can be, or can you, can you lend some insight as to how one can define whether or not that is, at, that is more or less going to be the trajectory of success, which is you're going to look outside of the existing industry for the innovation. Well, that is true. That is one of the common points, that it is from the periphery that new ideas get established. It's not because the core doesn't have the ideas. It's the problem that the core is so committed to an existing set of ideas that it can't really change its agenda to deal with those peripheral ideas that really are the same as those are within the existing core. So what can organizations do, given what we've just said, and during that gestation period, to open its opportunity for change? Because one thing is for sure, that initiation period is a period of randomness. So how can we design an organization to, where, where chance can favor the prepared mind, as Louis Pasteur said? Andy, I have a question. Yeah. Go back one slide. Whoop. Okay. Yeah. In some places where we do research on scenario planning, yeah. the scenario planning is of the innovation as a practice okay. that an organization wants to take on. And your, your link of new to old here is important. Um, for whom is the innovation journey a journey? Uh, if you have a 40-year meet one, presumably... 40 years. Yeah, presumably various generations of people yes. are in the journey, but they don't, one person doesn't see the whole journey. Mm -hmm. They start at 20 and they succeed. That's right. Uh, for the people that host the innovation, that actually will bring it into the organization, it's not really a journey, is it? It's a sort of event that they have to suddenly, there's a new baby and the family that you need to adopt or something like that. So for whom is the, the journey metaphor work for you? Is it the, are you sort of sitting as if you were the innovation, no. the actor is the innovation for the journey? We're studying an innovation for as long as it takes. And so the answer to that question is, <clears throat> depending upon the type of innovation, some people are coming and going as it is anyway. The people at the end are not there at the beginning. So there's been a transition so going Voyager, on in Voyager, this journey. The Voyager is the innovation. The journey is the innovation's journey and the different people that come and go and what they do as this journey unfolds. Okay. So how early in that journey does that implementation start working on? Where this starts? The implementation so that you do adopt it. Adopt it Usually right? it's at a point where you've got a prototype that has been developed and tested through the developmental process. Not before. Usually, well, those that did it before ran into trouble. They were so enamored with starting a business as quickly as possible that they forgot to figure out if it really works. And a lot of these innovations didn't work. Oh, maybe um, two in 10, Others say three or four in 10, but that's the rate. It's, it's the minority, the chance of failure far exceeds the prob probability of success. So the implementation part happens once you have a proof of concept. If, if, you ha if I were to put on my managerial hat, the answer is affirmatively yes. Because you see, during this stage, this developmental period, if I'm a company of the size of 3M, I got 250 of these developing. I only need a couple of these to implement and be successful. But don't invest the corporate treasury down all 250 of these innovations that are going on. Instead, do it on those that are clearly, that have evidence to substantiate, not only that they work, but that they are scale upable. <laughs> In terms, that's where the big money costs. It is the scale up of production and distribution and manufacturing facilities, all of which is far in excess of the cost of learning 
and going through these mistakes. But it also varies. So, for example, 3M invested $14 million in the developmental stage of cochlear implants and found in the implementation period that they had to sell it out and give it to the competitor because they had turned out that the innovation was for an orphan industry. No one expect, expected that the cochlear Im insertion of a cochlear implant allowing profoundly deaf people is a product that only um, hearing people would give to their children. Because hearing adults were ostracized from their community if they had the insertion of a cochlear implant. Maybe you've heard these stories, but it shows you the impact of investing in an effort that everybody thought would make a fact president upon the initial, uh, the Food and Drug Administration announced the appointment and the uh, approval of the cochlear implant for commercialization. At which time, President Ronald Reagan uh, conducted a uh, made, made a public announcement that this is the first time in history that a bionic biological device is replacing one of the five senses of learning. So from the point of view of social welfare advancement and commencement, that's pretty significant. <laughs> from a financial point of view, <laughs> they lost a boat. What were we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting involved in all kinds of interesting observations. Yeah. Well, look at this. Well, you would think that they would have, going through a Food and Drug Administration forces you to focus upon a certain appropriately designated clientele who then get inserted and experimented with to determine the efficaciousness of the implantation. And in the process of doing so, you are in recruiting certain kinds of patients, which are not the patients who are going to buy your product later on. And so here is a miscalculation, clearly. In hindsight, wouldn't they have gone to the 500, what they, they said, 500,000 people who were profoundly deaf? And so based upon those statistics, they would have so many potential clients. But they never really bothered, nor did they have access to those other 500,000 that were not in your clinical trial site. So some of these regulations and uh, clinical trials impede your access to other aspects like marketing that are critical for determining the success of an innovation. So even in the marketing case, we deal with you, but, you know, great luck, great chance. So what can you do to increase the odds of success? And at the very beginning, we said, how do we begin then to start thinking about, can you control this process when you recognize that innovations are not initiated in the spur of the moment, in a single dramatic incident, uh, an extended gestation period of seemingly random events are unfolding. So what can organizations do to increase the chance of innovation? Ricard Norman talked about this as a distinction between homeostatic and morphogenic change. Homeostatic being the change that defends and maintains its existing structure. And they're going to, obviously, try to find a way to control this as opposed to morphogenic change that transforms the structure through positive feedback and reinforcement. And of course, the key difference is whether the organization is viewed as enabling or constraining innovation. So it's to say the chance of innovation is going to increase if you design an organizational culture and structure that increases the likelihood of innovation. And this is what we were talking about this afternoon, about 3M's 
Lou, uh, Bill Coyne, senior vice president of technology at the time of 3M, was asked, would you give us, at here in his UK lecture, what are the elements of success of the 3M culture? To which he said, I'm glad to share you this, because it took us 100 years <laughs> to develop. So drop by drop, project by project, through all the administrations. And his answer was, if you were to develop a culture for innovation, it would declare the importance of innovation, make it a part of the company's self-image. All the trucks you'd see driving on the highways have innovation, 3M. Declare the importance. Foresight, find out where technologies and markets are going. Identify articulated and unarticulated needs. And in particular, therefore, go and listen in the back door what your customers are saying, not in the front door. Because in the back door is where they're going to be complaining and where the need for change is going to become evident. In the front door, you're going to get corporate speak. Stretch goals, make quantum improvements. In other words, I'm going to say 30% of sales of products have to come from new products from your division, and that will count for a substantial proportion of your bonus. Managers. Innovation's on the line here for your own bonus. Moreover, all employees, professional, technical, you are expected to be spending about 15% of your working time on innovation for the company good. But it gives you a chance to play so that when your boss comes to you and says, hey, where's this product that has to be dissolved? They're going to have to say, I'm sorry, I'm on, I'm on my innovation clock. Now, of course, we know <laughs> that most of the, that results in many people having to work an out 115% of their time. <laughs> but the story is out. It's clear. Empowerment, hire good people, trust them, delegate. Empowerment. Communications, open extensive exchanges, ground rules, forums, rewards. It's an intensely human activity. Emphasize recognition to 3M more than monetary rewards. Yeah? Did you apply something like that to your own innovation team? <sighs> to be honest, no. To be honest, I didn't make that connection. Isn't that strange? Uh, Those who do, do. Those who can't teach. <laughs> I have a colleague in, have a colleague in astronomy. In astronomy in this university, they, they did the equivalent of your number three. They got together and they said in their annual meeting, next year we should each have 10% of our activity that we have not done before. Because we're in yeah. business. Yeah. It'd be, it would, I could look back to say, you know, yeah, I, we followed some of those things. We had very open communications, and we did com collectively develop some stretch goals. We're going to study the process, not the outcomes or antecedents, and so forth. So we had high aspirations. Um, but I, no, I didn't think of implementing that as a strategy. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah. a, a question, uh, did you also look at governance of Yes, we did. And that takes us to... So here is the innovation finding. During the developmental period, all this stuff happens. What on earth is management doing? Is it just falling asleep and letting the innovation do nothing? So what guides this journey? And there we go into processes of leadership, which is your question, and learning and relationships. And with regard to, well, I'll get back to that, leadership, which is what you raised, we observed that management actually was quite involved, top-level management, about 
of the events that unfolded, they included the actors being top level managers outside of the innovation projects in the company or in the uh, commercial effort. And we found them performing, there were four basically different roles occurring. Some people were serving as the critic, challenging investing goal progress at the resource allocation committee meetings that we sat in on, raising the kinds of questions. I'm not sure if you have, where is your evidence for your statement that this project will enable or increase 20% or whatever. So it was very positive, constructive kinds of questioning. And you also had your sponsor and your mentors. Sometimes one person, oftentimes two. The sponsor higher up in the organization, procuring, advocating, championing the effort. The mentor, coaching, counseling, the person who's been around the block before and tries to get entrepreneurs to listen to them. <laughs> you know the difficulty of that. But then there was a, what Norman called an institutional, uh, pardon me, a statesman leader, which we were calling institutional leader, who was setting the structure, settling disputes, and keeping the checks and balances on the critics and the sponsors. So that they could, if left to themselves, they're going to pull the plug. If left to themselves on a project, they're going to invest the corporate treasury. And so how do we maintain a check and balance? Because what we need is to say, we're dealing with an innovative venture with an entrepreneurial team presenting their best case to you, and you in turn have to judge whether or not what they have is worth continuing to invest. But you don't have any evidence to substantiate that. And during this developmental period, this, that occurs later on. Uh, a follow-up question. You mentioned before that uh, mm -hmm. the um, involvement of the old system, i.e. the business unit, in, uh, early on increases the chance of success of an innovation. Did you see that representatives of the old system, the business, had filled one of these roles? And if so, which one? Well, very good. In the larger, here's the entrepreneur for this, his or her team making the presentation to higher-ups in the organization who are not only in charge of and giving allocations to the project, but are also running the operating business, the various divisions, etc. So in that sense, they, the people who we observed in these resource allocation committees, were also managing these operations. But I, I, I must add a little observation. As we observed these resource allocation committee meetings, they, they were scripted so well. The entrepreneurial team would rehearse their practice the day before. And they would come together to find and recognize our progress, our difficulties, but scenarios we have for dealing with the difficulties. And here's a prototype. See, it looks like this pass it around so that you'd have some kind of a tangible product to show the resource allocation committee members, usually five or six or seven, along with the rest of the innovation team in the, in the room. And the, when, when, for an hour, hour and a half meeting presentation, the, the team was savvy in knowing that if I can hook them, we can continue to keep our funding. And the way I hook them is I present our agenda and we speak and for an hour and a half, let's say an hour session, review session, we will speak for about 50 minutes where we present the various issues, the projects, show our own reservations about the projects, but methods that we have for dealing with them. Notice that leaves little time, at most 10 minutes for any question. And by that time, in the 50th minute of the meeting, we know that the, the executives have to move on to their next appointment. And so the question becomes what, what suggestions you have, and at that point in time, it becomes one of motivating the team. So thank you so much for your good presentation. And I see what you're doing here, and I think you're considering this. 
I do have a concern about the market, but we, you'll deal with that. So I encourage your team to pursue this and continue on. Consider that as opposed to another advice that, or conclusion that we draw. You can dramatically improve the odds of innovation success. By that meaning, we can identify and make a more productive session by doing two things. Changing the whole agenda of a resource allocation committee meeting in which you assign and you ask for this particular innovation team that the entrepreneurial team will present. We're going to ask you in a one hour session to present your entire effort in 15 minutes. You're never going to get 15 minutes, point one. Second, I'm going to ask you, Peter, will you serve as the sponsor and discuss the pros and what you see as the possibilities? And you, Jonas, would you please be the critic? I want you to raise significant good questions about the effort and the productiveness of this. I'd like you to do that in about oh, three, four, five questions, and you in terms of an argument for why we should not. Ricard, would you please be the institutional leader, keeping Jonas and Peter in check, making sure that they speak well and speak to the issue, and no name calling. Now, let's see, would you proceed? The odds are great that you're much more likely to identify the problems much like you would in a jury where you have the protagonist and the defendant before a judge who governs the process and a jury sitting out there trying to understand what is the best procedure. So that led us to think about Norman's statements of viewed view, viewpoints of statesman leadership. He emphasized it exerts statesman leadership. Leaders uh, exert influence by changing the rules and the plans of the game, right? They're setting the standards. They understand the historical lineage of the company, its industry, what it stands for. It's a steward of the institution's assets. And subsequent studies show by um, Tor Hernes and Mike and Schultz that the more managers and top level managers understood the past of the organization, the further into the future they could anticipate the strategy. Now, isn't that interesting? So good stewards understand the past in order to look into the future, as opposed to these merger and acquisition crazed companies where the leaders know nothing about what they are acquiring. And they are then to be somehow stewards, understanding the identity and the purpose and the competence of the past into the future. It changes. You could say that opposite of statesman leadership is transactional leadership. And then he did emphasize the acute sensitivity to internal political processes and tensions. Emphasizing a frame or a theory for interpreting dynamics, the means to influence the organization's power, cognitive and control systems, in conflict resolutions. That is, he says, the most central task. And I must say, uh, it's perhaps the most overlooked task in a lot of organizations. So a basic proposition that we come out with is the need for pluralistic leadership, where these different roles are not performed by, first of all, divorce leadership from persons and put them in and view them as functions. And everybody can exercise leadership depending upon the kind of function they perform. 
And some of them will be mentors and sponsors. Others will be critics. Others will be institutional leaders at different times during the innovation journey. In the beginning, you need a strong critic to counter the rosy colored views, glasses, of the mentor and sponsor. In the middle, you also need a strong institutional leader in order to keep them in check. In the middle, you'll want the institutional leader to get out of the way so that the sponsor and the mentor and the critic can exercise their voice but transition into the end, where in the end, if the critic is up here, the plug is pulled. And the sponsor needs, if, it, if the sponsor's down here, you've got a real problem in implementing the effort. So beginning to think about different stages and beginning to think about how one might assign these roles to different people for different situations becomes, I think, an opportunity for pluralistic leadership to work. Some people don't like this because they don't want to see or engage in conflict or dialogue. But that's usually true because of personality conflicts rather than substance. So we need to somehow be training people and managers into managing processes for conflict resolution. And a lot of it has to do with power. <laughs> we can talk about agreement among parties on actions, the agree or disagree, and we could talk about balance of power and status, symmetrical, equal power, or empowerment or asymmetrical, where one dominates another. And you can begin to see from the point of view of learning, the likelihood is for adaptive trial and error learning or for good dialectical conflict resolution, we need symmetrical power among the actors. For if they're not, you usually have persistent action here where the dominant power party pushes their ideas and the less powerful parties step aside, or oftentimes compulsory behavior, where the less powerful people are forced, coerced, into these kinds of activities. And so here you give leadership by empowerment, increasing learning, leadership by imposition, decreasing learning. Comments? Have, um, have you observed uh, in terms of uh, innovation governance how the, uh, is there a typical sort of role or balance of uh, power or, or learning style that you observe in, in the governance of innovation? The learning styles that I found that were persistent often resulted in people feeling compulsed, regulated, and to be in conditions or situations of hopelessness and withdrawal and screw it. And I'm getting out of here. As opposed to these conditions that empowered the people, even though they were hierarchically not as powerful as the others, it was the powerful people who empowered or enabled or encouraged people to speak their minds that actually encouraged debates and, in fact, set them up by saying, would you be the protagonist, would you be the defendant, and this is a proper role in innovation under conditions where we don't know what is the best way to go. So that legitimates as a statesman, as a leader, it would ensure that we have symmetrical power because I'm empowering you to speak for and you against a proposition. Did you, say, did you notice any relationship between the diversity of the backgrounds and skills and experiences 
experience of the leadership teams in those environments that were better at listening to... Yeah, the big one. The big one. The big one is trust. Where the top leadership team or the people engaged had sufficient number of experiences and had built trust in one another so that I can disagree with you on this project, but I still, I'm okay, you're okay. We continue on as colleagues. Was homogeneity of backgrounds and experience, though, a bar to good innovation conversations, or did you find any evidence of that? Because typically in the diversity debate, the argument is that more diverse your leadership team, more diverse your management team, and by diverse, I mean skills, backgrounds, disciplines, as well as mm -hmm. you know, and so on. The better you are likely to develop well, well, uh, well functioning organizations, yep. and, and the more marketable you will be. I wonder if, in, in the innovation journey, that actually proves to be the case. Isn't it ironic that while we want a diverse organization? reflecting lots of different points of view. We want homogeneity in direction. Hmm. And my, my sense is that the diversity dilemma exacerbates the trust or the sense of comfort between people who have to disagree on other matters. So therein, I think, leads to another significant statesman leadership issue of trying to find ways in which leaders empower diverse and different people. Because left to themselves, they probably won't. Left to themselves, they also have different leadership power or, or perceptions and will withdraw if they are the sub. Many studies have shown this, this is not from our study, that organizational learning is dramatically influenced or reduced when you have asymmetrical power between the parties involved. Yeah, we've got about. Ten minutes left. Do oh, you, do you have more things you would like to share with us? Do you want more questions? How would you like to proceed? One second, please. That is a great question. <laughs> <laughs> One way of addressing that question is to say no. I there there are, however, a few points that I did want to bring out. And I shouldn't have done what I did, but I have. So now I, oh, here it is. I need to find this. And I wanted to come to, so we talked about dimensions of leadership. And we talked this morning about that, so I don't need to talk about what is competent and incompetent leadership in terms of the dimensionality of the leaders. And I'm finding that very few individual leaders have the capability to deal with the multidimensional complex tasks they're dealing with. And so it's not a matter of need, it, or it's not a matter of capability, but organizational pluralism, where leadership roles are shared in a management team, becomes essential if an organizational leadership is to be viewed competent versus incompetent. Bill Coyne concluded, innovation is anything but orderly. It is sensible in that our efforts are all directed at reaching our goals, but organization and the process, and sometimes the people, can be chaotic. We are managing in chaos, and that is the right way to manage. Whoa. So this idea of can you control innovation? I conclude you cannot. The process, the journey, reflects random and chaotic 
dimensions and processes, which you can't control with concepts of accountability and responsibility for outcome. But you can start thinking about recognizing that that innovation journey, you can expect encounters a wide variety of common issues. And you can learn to maneuver the innovation by practicing and increasing your capabilities of conflict management, of learning and leadership and relating that otherwise left to themselves are going to result in probably less successful efforts. I was going to talk about, but I'll mention this in conclusion, Norman's clinical research method. It really focused on learning more than on testing or any hypothesis or theory. And I really resonate with this notion of engaged scholarship as one of focusing more on learning between the researchers and the participants, different constituents in the process, rather than testing a theory. Second, it's linking language of the researcher with stakeholders to understand change dynamics. This issue of vocabulary, of language, of semantics, uh, and pragmatics, of rhetoric, is something we all need to learn more about. <laughs> Divergent attributions by actors and observers are crucial, but are hard to get, as we were just discussing. And we need a theory of change and how to achieve change seem to be two different things. We need a theory of change, Mac. We need multiple theories of change, because if you only have one theory, you're sort of stuck. And so I attended a um, day and a half seminar at the Harvard Business School that brought together the leading corporate executives, the leading corporate uh, uh, consulting companies, and the leading academics in this domain called organization change. And the purpose was to break the code of change, which is to say, to create a new order. And the result was we never broke code because we, everybody talked about plan change in top management direction and the need for getting unity and agreement and dealing with resistance. I presented you know, some other models of change at that seminar namely not just plan change, but also dialectics and evolution and life cycle. And I was basically booed out of the place. <laughs> but the problem is you may preference plan change, but if you don't know dialectics or evolution or life cycle theories of change, you're sort of stuck because a lot of times an organization does not follow a plan change model. So what does a manager then do? You try to reprimand the people in the organization to fall into place. Otherwise, the train is going to leave the tracks and you will stand on the station. And you know, what a disastrous way of thinking about change as leaving all the people, the good people, also some begrundled people behind. As opposed to saying, a wise manager who has expanded his dimensions of leadership would recognize there are other models of change. So if you're experiencing significant resistance, for goodness sake, introduce dialectics as a model for learning. Thank you. That's it. <laughs>